Hello, and can everybody hear me okay? Welcome to the 80th Wednesday afternoon Brooklyn Rail Poetry Reading. My name's Anselm, I'm the poetry editor. And um, today our reading has been put together by Shiv Koteka. Shiv will read first, followed by Violet Spurlock, Joseph Kaplan, Jackie S, and Montaza Mary. Um, before we get started, I'll just let you know that you should keep an eye on the chat as we're um, as the reading goes on. There'll be links to the various uh, works available online by each of our readers, and uh, some information about the rail and related matters. It's uh, great to see everybody. Um, the April issue of The Rail has um, just gone online as of last night slash this morning. And the poetry section has poems by uh, Roberto Tejada, Eric Baus, um, Mary and Mona Lisa Garazzi, and a number of others. So check that out if you get a chance. And I'm gonna introduce Shiv who is based in New York and writes across genre. His book, The Switch, makes a case for friendship over love using fiction and verse. His book, Extrigue, novelizes Billy Wilder's noir double indemnity shot by shot. He writes about art, film, and underwear for publications like Four Columns, Bomb, Gay Letter, and Freeze, where he is a contributing editor. Please welcome Shiv to the rail. Um, thank you. Anselm um, for this invitation and to the Brooklyn Rail team for putting this on. It's really wonderful um, to Fong, Carolyn, Nick, um, everyone who I may have missed. And to the readers, I'm really excited to be able to um, sit at my house in Brooklyn and hear you all read. Um, I've missed hearing you read or have wanted to hear you read in some capacity or, or another. So this is a, a nice excuse to um, to do that. I'm going to read a small parable. It's very short. I don't think it's a story. It's called Lodestone. A series of walls were erected to skirt the outer edges of a valley. Then several beds were, of water were added at different places along the valley, giving it coastlines and some shadow. Sometimes the beds were common, so also mute, while at other moments they were heard thrashing. He added shores and then corners. He arranged big plants. He made long lists. Fred wrote down each space he hoped to spend populating over the weekend, making Fred feel satisfied about the night. The region known as Lodestone was nearly complete. The walls he'd wrote, written in were at a legible distance from the hills now, and between them the valley itself, which according to Fred's list was to be renamed at some point my sinkhole. A few more beds were added to the outskirts for those who might pass through the region before Fred had the chance to write them in the following morning. Before Fred lifted his pen from the page, before, which is to say before he fell to bed, he pitched a road sign at the end of the region on which he scrawled the words, keep out, I'm still working, and wrote in a bird named Todd to keep guard of his work, the mostly empty region known as Lodestone, where Fred hoped to host various situations involving major and minor characters, crowds of them perhaps, with overly zealous and responsive erogenous zones, for instance, or with, uh, or altogether obeying the commands of a DJ or in line at a petting zoo. The bird he wrote in last woke up the moment Fred shut his eyes and she named herself haughtily almost Todd, keeper of the region known as Lodestone. Though Fred would attest that he lacked the memory to prove it, Fred had written Todd into the region of Lodestone many years before that night, like in 2015, before he fitfully wrote her out again, before abandoning the re region completely, repre repressing his need for it, so as to take a job in the city and eat things out of the fridge alone at night or among others, i.e. in public. Fred anticipated Todd to sense her arrival to the region as if it were her first time, like a birth might feel or a boon, but Todd sensed nothing of the sort. Her emergence into the scene presented itself to her as a memory problem, i.e. as a return. When she arrived, her bird body jostled with something resembling information. 
water sprayed and feathers fell. And she then understood that she'd left this place once before. She didn't remember the act of leaving, but edged along the desire she once felt to. Todd interpreted the inter information for its supposed temporality. She felt a desire to leave and was determined about it. She wasn't supposed to come back, i.e. she was supposed to leave for a short period of time, not for a short period of time, but to leave with enough time to be lazy, stretch out, ignore the valley, roam the hills. So she tried to remember the hills she escaped to and the joy of being lazy without having memory of either. Todd was sitting in an unfamiliar area, newly written in against a newly written wall of a newly written church, which swelled with the silence she knew she had not heard before. This is Todd, she said out loud to the empty region, which provoked no new feature nor old one. There was no repetition, no echo. She prodded at the memory problem. Was there life in between being? If not, what was there? There were hills, there was the sea, there was the desire to remember them. Todd felt happiness at identifying these things and then sadness that they, unlike her speech, were not repeatable. In between the emotions, however, there appeared something like reason or a strategy that currently her memory problem would resolve itself if she could only find a way to leave it behind. Todd left Lodestone once before. She'd grabbed car keys before, ditched the loser part of herself before, left this place for a better place than one newly written, a lot, uh, for a life with a downstairs apartment and an upstairs pool and a comfortable living room, so comfortable she thought she could, if she wanted to, host the devil in it, for why shouldn't he come to visit? The, de the devil was the one who helped her get the keys in the first place. When the memory stopped, she could not rewind it. She told herself, be calm and you're not lost and none of the things you don't want are in these hills, these unidentifiable hills where it is approximately zero dollars to stay at night in a bed of water of your own in this valley that is empty of people. Todd closed her eyes and leaned her head on some new tree, but Todd's memory, but Todd closed her eyes and leaned her head on some new tree, but her memory leaned in the opposite direction toward a future point, suddenly shaking Fred from his sleep. He'd been dead asleep for about 20 minutes, a disco nap. Then he said, scrap it. These walls suck. Many doubts arrested Fred's waking mind in Todd's imagination, which if you recall, contained no memory. At this exact moment, Fred forgot what Lodestone, what about Lodestone he wrote Todd in to protect. He could not see what he wrote the walls and valleys and beds in for, could not reconstruct what re the region was, why it had to be a region or why it needed a guard named Todd. Was this the key? Todd thought briefly to her forgotten departure. As Fred erased Todd from the region known as Lodestone, Todd heard a sound from the region's edges a sound she described as unhearable and a few moments later, but exactly the same. Fred erased the whole page starting with the sidewalk. It was not, he thought, untreated enough, not suburban. If he could go at it with something better than just a pen, something like scissors or octopus ink or wood or alien skin. He left the table he was writing at and moved to the sink where he emptied his pen and then back to his desk to refill it with more ink. He poured himself a cup of coffee for it was late at night and he set to his task once again to write a fiction in which the setting does not feel to anyone in it as if it's a scar. Thanks. Thanks, Jiv. And thanks for putting this together. And uh, next we're going to have Violet Spurlock read. First, I need to give a quick shout out to my old buddy, Pradeep Dalal. Hey, Pradeep, good to see you. And uh, Violet Spurlock's poet and author of Alloyed Bliss, which was published last year by Eilat. And if I'm going to pronounce this right, Versus, Versus, Versus from Gauss PDF, also uh, published last year. In addition to writing poetry, she also facilitates a writing group for trans authors and is currently at work on a novel. Please welcome Violet Spurlock. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you to my fellow readers and the staff of The Rail, and particularly thank you to Shiv for 
asking me to read. Um, there's no time to explain, so we will just get right into it. Achievement dizzy, ISO, contemplative era, since everything must be shared, frame wants with chemical stop gaps, one bad day, 10 winters of solitude. Acronym salad makes words stakes, milly pinky poly peggy. Druggy train refutes dreamy screen. Just cause you don't live astride, a few seconds into the one hour stolen from me, a lifetime is not enough. Emerges a refrain which can only gain strength, a lifetime is not enough. Since each repetition occurs closer to death, a lifetime is not enough. So sufficiency is not a compromise, it's impossible. This is why we've moved into various forms of non-doing, probing the negative depths, because invisibility matches infinity, despite the promise of rockets. What's flexed below expert purview bespeaks a potential we can imagine to be indefinite, though to appear as seed requires a tendency to blossom, predictable and petty. But isn't that how we love, tastelessly? Re-entering doubt with a less plastic brain, no car, new dreams, mid fade, but all subject to change, I am seeking hours. They are not stored in a jar. Essentially, our idiomatic equations are correct, but offer us nothing, a bushel for your bucket. In fact, my uptake is increasing, so why don't I believe my meals? The critics don't help, they are the birds. No glory leads me into the sun. Whether what thrives despite can thrive because amounts to an investigation into reversibility, sameness, those signs of an indifference best kept general or to oneself. This is not the one time the lie is true. I won't implore you. Yellow bands on our wrists bring the knobs we turn into a song. There is a hat on the floor and love travels. Don't make these fluids compete like electrons at the flea circus. Quiet now, the hours come to open zones. One jerk doesn't want to work, the other jerk works. The indifference of a minor carcinogen between them, wind blowing plastic between them. Those who don't want to do anything should start early. You say a triangle is round, so I cross my eyes to blur forms. Set to rights by simple rhythms, caveat, not impressed, though I should be. A brush of ghost hair, lost friends, best lost, yet still here, who will I tell? A parasite spreads happy purpose. Did you read your mind? And the butcher looked nowhere else. Living involves convincing others to live. This is how favors are intrinsically repaid. One or two people seem responsible for one's birth, yet no individual answers for one's death, assuming one is not murdered. A million tiny anti-mothers along the way, one made of fear, one of sleeplessness, one of joy beyond limits. Because I always ended up in rooms, I thought they had no end. I distrusted opinions, preferring fidelity to an attitude which adapted to situations. Knowing how to talk is knowing how to deploy one's mood. It's only when the dance is kept up, sitting still, that guests do not grow disconsolate. Going home is sleeping in public. Warned away from the coffee houses, which are really living rooms full of booze, I was a grain in a plank of wood, unchoosing yet bitchy, lights dimmed around me, a symphony of crashing lamps. Don't bring love to the potluck, empathy machine short circuit. It's too easy to call a book bad. So being revivified by ancient chores, assuming the best of the youth, this is the stuff of dinner invitations. 
bring your pockets along. We cannot but help but shed bits, evidence you will enjoy contemplating in silence, alone, in thoughtless rubbing. Now is the time for leaving you to it. Things left out have a tendency to get bumpy, like the eggy chunks that became me. Flat at extremities, the parking lot of childhood, loudly patterned tech wear on corporate island, truck loud as the distant earth, panging past boomtown echo, train scholars squeezing charts for dear data. Later and sooner, true commitments evade stages. Now is when we wait just a minute. Easy beds filched by good offers, exemptions for work, chores, love. I would rather be an extrapolation of a principle than conclusions drawn against whoever has to share air. Abundance dwarfs containment, we know this, but confusing cyclical boons with exponential cancers is rule one. I'm speaking to our numbness, not our sensation. A milieu, a tight pair of socks you never take off. Fetishes like humans are very adaptable. Pleasure is generous, indulgent with poison. Blood flows, regularity smooths what enters me. Diarrhea is the price of poetry. Spent the morning looking for my likeliness so that proof wouldn't enter the picture. Simulating cryptic puzzle combat the bed is so close to the dogma. I wondered which words could have prompted this primordial orgiastic cluster of kinesthesia, but it turned out I didn't want to know. The words were kind of fucked up. I reassured my world, there's more to it than this, or it's so incredibly unlikely. But even in probabilities, misty heights or murky depths, I expect my expectation to know its target. Even if you never come, surely it is you who I know I want to come. Not so surely in our bed, looking like you're riding the line of best fit. I think, I think it's time to take responsibility, by which I mean use punctuation. And tomorrow is always the time to talk to your kids about snacks, where they come from. I'll be giggling in the distance. I'll be a fucked duck farming out my thinking, giving away the proceeds. This fence is here because I willed it. This world is like a favor I called in. I can never remember if glut means abundance or dearth, probably because it is the gut which bears both. I'm warning my parents into the future, piercing the veil of politeness to find sameness of all art from the desk. The sitter is all change, zen millions. Tapping the table to signify joy? Feeling in public is a demand one places and is placed under. There is no private space. There are ebbs and flows in self-consciousness. There are friends seeking love and studios to strut in. A temporary barrier should be leapt over. A permanent barrier studied lovingly. Nuance is comfy flat dialectics. Look, I mixed the philosophy words with the sex words, casting doubt on assumption A, that acts of sweetness ascribe sweetness to their recipient. The question the world foists upon the women it hates, is forgiveness of horrific acts indicative of a secret desire for horrific acts to be committed? But we just explicitly rejected sex as forgiveness, yet a hidden pathway led us to the same conclusion. The difference between being smart and being a smarty pants suggests intelligence of the legs is considered ostentatious, an issue for seductive walkers, giving the lie to the pornographic assertion that the body is erotic in essence when it has been tasked with finding better ways to waste five minutes. I had a plan, it had a hole. My optimism aimed at its provenance like a prop gun. It's hard to tell the world about love since it holds more love than language can. So let the world do the work. 
Writing is a practice of shaving hate. Here's how to take what the bigot said with the mellowness of an aspirin. Watch for effects as your body carries words through time to the end of intention. It was not okay. It was not gone, too far or otherwise. When we examined each other's shoulders to assess the burdens they could bear, we never failed to take the chance to admire each other's shoulders, the thin ridge grown thick with cares, whenever empty proclaiming lightness, shape disappeared into texture, how loving feels to fingers kneading care into shoulders. When one has outlived riddles, one is the reason for gatherings. Pain is lifted in crowds. Each person gathers to be a small part, passing the recurring question to nobody in particular so that the passing is continuous. Before resignation, acceptance. Most of what appears neutral is secretly good. Wind, light, strangers. What keeps these secrets from being obvious is the ego's desire to be its own source. The real sources are too humble to speak or careful enough to only whisper. The first time, the second chance, dancing in a mirrored ballroom, glimpses of the inevitable between mysterious costume changes. If a pure accident enters the room, it immediately enters the rhythm as well and so becomes measured. Thank you so much. Thank you, Violet. Now uh, we're gonna hear from Joseph Kaplan. Joseph is the author of Loser, just out from Make Now Books. His other books include Poem Without Suffering, All Nightmare, Introductions 2011 to 2012, Kill List, and Democracy is Not for the People. He lives in Philadelphia. When you write something like Kill List, basically all you can do after that is go to Philadelphia. Please welcome Joseph Kaplan. I wonder, um, I wonder how many people on the Zoom remember Kill List, actually. There's, because I hear that there's been a big vibe shift. Anyway, thank you, Anselm, and <clears throat> everyone at the rail. Thank you so much, Shiv, for asking me to read, and to my fellow readers. Thank you for reading with me, letting me read with you. I'm just going to um, read. I'm just going to read a little bit of a middle part of um, of Loser, which is a a book about some different states of reaction rendered in a few different shifting monologues. So might it seems like it's maybe still still relevant, maybe perpetually relevant. I mean really, my gosh. Doesn't that just sound so good? It does, doesn't it? It sounds amazing. I mean it really like conjures something, just the thought of it gets me all like, I don't know, fuzzy, delighted. I mean, I'm not trying to be corny, but really it warms you. It warms your heart. It gets all in there, you know, into that place inside, that happy place right in your chest where your soul hooks up to your tummy and makes it go, whoosh, makes it go, mmm. It's like getting kissed. It's like holding your lover's hand on a pier, listening to the sea wrap itself around the wood pilings, the spray rising up and then disappearing around you. It's a fresh breeze on your contented face, the smell of dry laundry. And doesn't that just perk you right up, even if you're feeling low? If you're, you know, a bit sad, doesn't that just send a jolt of joy through your brain? Doesn't that just make your hair stand on end, make your eyes a bit brighter, make your toes curl up, make your fingers splay out stiff and edgy? Doesn't that just 
throw your mouth wide open like the facade of a building being blown clean off, your tongue flopping out wet as the underside of a seal, the floor of your opened mouth filling up with saliva like a cave or a pool, your whole face humid and sopping, the drool running out of it like an overflowing sink, like a cracked pipe, does that not just pick up your tongue and pull streaming cords of drool out of your raging glands to trill uncontrollably down your chin, to overflow your jaw and rain down the front of your crisp dress shirt, to cover you in your own drool, to spray your drool all over the bottom of your face and down onto your beautiful new shirt? soaking those carefully woven threads with thick foaming globs of spit from deep within your mouth, from within your burning hot mouth, this most visceral excretion, this desiring geyser, this endless stream, doesn't it just seize you? No, not at all, not even a little. Well, gee, are you sure? Not even a wee little bit, a little bitty, bitty boo bit, a wee bit for the baby, for the baby boo boo? No, well then I don't, I just, I don't know what to say. I'll have to say, I'm sorry, I guess. I'll have to apologize, sure. I'm sorry, I'm really, truly sorry. I didn't mean to insult. I didn't mean to overstep, to stumble unbidden into assumptions unbecoming of our relationship. I definitely did not mean to assume anything at all about your character or to suggest anything improper that you wouldn't be honest with me, for example. I would never think that. I trust you. There's not a word that comes out of your mouth that is not hallowed for me with the luminous fact of its utter truthfulness. And any silences you would stay within, any reticence you would wish to hold on to, that is also your prerogative. Of course, your appetites are your own without a requisite obligation to advertise them. It is our responsibility to anticipate those desires. That is our duty. It's not your concern. You're here to be delighted, to be surprised, to have your faculty suddenly made to wait, energized within this experience. An experience, of course, that we provide to you as a service. We serve you, we love to serve you. It's our calling in life to be by your side, to be at your beck and call. You don't need to be embarrassed. It's what we want. We want this to do anything so long as it's for you. Listen, please, listen. We'll do anything. We'll do anything at all. We'll give you whatever you want. Please just ask us any possession, any amount of money, everything we have, we pledge to you. It doesn't matter to us. We couldn't care less. Look, we'll open up our wallets. We'll turn out our pockets. We'll dump it all onto the ground, onto the soft, grassy ground, onto the smooth, warm pavement. All of our money, we'll splash it all onto the ground. We can go to the ATM right now and take out all of our money. It's easy, we just stick the card in. We just punch in the numbers. They're easy to remember. We didn't go with anything complicated. It's something stupid like a sequence of four ascending digits or your first child's birthday, it's no problem. It's just routine. Anyone can do it. A child could do it. A little baby smashing its baby fingers against the machine's glass, its baby brain tumbling into alignment, looking out its nervous sparks to travel down the arm, to the wrist, to the hand, to make those little numbers glow and activate. It's so intuitive. The ATM calling back to you, with its staccato cooing, delighting in each little touch. Technology is amazing. It's such a gift. It makes everything so easy, so relatable. Like when people say, that could be us. We could be that baby's fingers. 
we could be doing that right now together, our little fingers on the glass, united, caressing the machine until it spits out a stream of money, all from within its plastic mouth like paper vomit, as if on cue, every little bit we have, every single dollar, every dirty flap of a dollar bill, every crumpled strip of cash, we'll give it all to you, into your hands, like water, we'll pour it into your cupped hands, We'll let it stream out and over your fingers, the cool run of money, the dollars washing over your palms. They'll rain down over you. They'll hover suspended in the air. So you can just grab them. You can scoop them up like from a basin to splash against your face. All of the different denominations, the ones and tens and twenties and fifties and hundreds even, poking out from between your fingers, caught and crumpled in your grip. We'll toss them into the air, and then you can try and catch them, bundling them up, clasping at them with every able limb laid out on your back, legs kicking, flailing, hands grasping, toes and fingers wrapped tight together, the money drifting over you like a tremble of intuition. We could do this. It's perfectly natural. It's a time-honored tradition, widely accepted. In fact, it's hard to imagine this world without it, a world where one could be barred from indulging in this classic expression of cultural unity. It reminds us of our commonly shared beliefs, my friend, my beautiful friend, my most cherished companion, intimate of my soul. I'm like a little possum scampering up behind you, a little puppy dog, a little stray, an orphan who suddenly found their home. I feel like I owe you, like I must try to begin in some small way, at least to pay it back. I need to get even. I need to show you that I can be there for you without resentment, without hesitation, with eagerness and enthusiasm because it's what I want. I can't wait, I'm here dying of anticipation, dying of desire, waves of nervous energy coursing through me, my fingers tapping, teeth grinding, knees twitching up and down, waiting to come bounding up to you and give you every ounce of my faith. I want you to feel my presence as love, as the love that it is, as a diaphanous shield so that you can rest easy in the knowledge that you're safe. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Next reader is going to be Jackie S. Jackie S. is a novelist and the author of Daryl, from which was published last year by Clash. <laughs> That is her first book of hopefully many. That's the main thing you ought to know about her for now. Please welcome Jackie S. Thanks so much. Um, I'm still kind of blown away by that reading. I actually, um, thank you so much for to the, the organizers of this too. I was saying in the sound check that I feel like things like this kind of are, are a good answer to the question, uh, any poets alive right now? And uh, you know, I watch these videos all the time. They, and I have to be very careful what I say, actually, because uh, we're going to be recorded. Um, so I'm going to read from a, a novel manuscript in progress. And I, I, you know, I, I kind of I don't want to riff on the 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 prompt too much. I mean, somehow there are rhymes in this book, and there are politics in this book. And I thought I'd read from a part that has a little bit of politics that doesn't have rhymes. And I kind of wanted to say that, you know, for me, it's like kind of an experiment in writing something that's really multi-perspectival. And, uh, you know, a lot of these perspectives sort of come to be humbled. And we don't really have the time to see how that happens. Um, and so perhaps some of these characters' views will be confused with mine. I, I hope that doesn't happen. You're all clever people. Um, so, but right now I'll, I'll just give you like a little sort of sense of where we are. Um, we're outside the heavy metal coffee shop in Eugene, a, a real place. Um, and uh, I think we're gonna see a little bit of, uh, of Martha and Lisa here. And these are 
Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you their points of view. So I, I, don't, I don't think I need more context than that. It's the trouble with not reading poems anymore. You know, it's like a, a lyric poem is so compact. It's like just one performance. Um, okay, but uh, enough stand up. Um, here we go. At this point, the recording, uh, so she's talking into her voice recording. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to make cuts because the section doesn't fit. Um, at this point, the recording lapsed into an anxious style, half chronicle of the last month, half things that Martha had to do that day, including the laundry, more difficult now without the car, punctuated by int intrusive regret. Why did I say that? Well, so what had actually happened was that Penny and Lisa had moved in. They'd all been drunk when they weren't sleeping or working with the rare moments of consciousness consumed by highly absorbed conversations, really monologues by Lisa on the topic of trans culture. So misery. And things had gotten much worse since Lisa had started dabbling in sex work, which as far as Martha could tell meant placing mildly intimidating Craigslist ads as a dominatrix. And had she gotten bites and playing with her webcam? And this act of slumming it apparently connected her to the grand legacy of black trans women, and she didn't seem to see an insult in saying so. Martha said to Georgia on one of the walks they'd been taking for privacy, if being a sex worker is more about the economy of queer moral authority than the economy of money, then that isn't the real deal. Georgia had sensibly replied that she thought so too, but that the falseness was probably a good thing, since the alternative was to have Johns coming through the house or to have to rescue her from jail or a dicey situation. They agreed it was better not to challenge her about it. Phony is good, but it kept getting worse. For example, Lisa couldn't shut up about transness. It was apparently a quality distinct from the act of transition, something that trans people all possessed by virtue of being trans, but which they were also at constant risk of betraying. Martha had once made the mistake of observing out loud that this reminded her of Zionism and the ease of being labeled a self-hating Jew by others no more Jewish than you are. She would quickly drawn the conclusion that this resonance was nearly impossible to discuss without other Jews in the room. None of Lisa, Georgia, Penny, they had never had to develop a serious point of view on Zionism or any other nationalism beyond a diffuse opposition that was a little bit rooting for the underdog, a little bit countercultural, a little bit left, a little bit fuck you, dad. Of course, their sympathies were with Palestine, as were Martha's. That much was right. But to Martha, their sympathies were cheap. They'd never had to reject a complex appeal. There was no engagement with Zionism as a matter of hope or safety or disappointment or losing who you are. It was all black and white to them from the beginning. And none of them really had any contact with what nation had meant in Europe and sadly still does, or for that matter in Palestine. Their problems seemed thoroughly American. America had kicked them around, it kicked others around and any evil in the world was probably a result of that. An old friend, Lior, had often told her that there are to first approximation, no genuine anarchists in America. American leftists are, he said, permanently stuck at the age of campism, at, at the stage of, of campism and resentment. Because until the left actually wins something, there's nothing to naturally distinguish a critique of power as such from the superpower you find yourself the suffering guilty conscience of. In the end, any successful movement for freedom would have to confront and shed its own militant and nationalistic tendencies, propped up by decades or centuries of perhaps genuinely well-motivated and defensive resistance and aggression. But in America, this would never happen, so the leftists would remain in immaturity. And the Israeli left was different. We reached the next stage and we failed. But the meaning and finality of that failure was an open question. This, he said, was why Martha should make Aliyah, to come to the Jewish state so that she could join the more difficult fight against it. This was also the only time he ever cited Torah to her, 1 Samuel 8, a passage where Israel begs for a king like the other nations and are cursed for it. See, David isn't the hero, he's the punishment. At the time, Martha had felt betrayed. Even old Lior was a Zionist after all, his support only another condescending trick. But now she was starting to see his point. Lisa's stridency and the ease with which the others went along with it were potent reminders that if there ever was a trans nation, Sorry, that is a thing that is mentioned a few times by Lisa. Um, Martha would be a Jew there as much as she was now in this dismal apartment, just as her grandparents had been in Hungary, then in America, then in Israel. She would always be suspect, no matter how privately atheistic or, or, or irreverent she was, and she was, and they were. Her grandfather, Samuel, had once described the difference between the descent you express and the descent you more simply are. He told her to remember that as Jews, they would always be the enemies of the nation builders, a wide group which for, for him that included not only the people who actually called themselves nationalists and fascists, but also at times communists, Zionists, and American businessmen. Anti-Semitism, he said, was at its core a rage against the, impetus, the impotence of all national projects. And it's so often aimed at the annihilation of Jews because the grievance has nothing to do with what we do or have. The grievance is with what we mean. Martha, at that time named Marcus, these characters are trans, okay, um, had visited Israel one time, age 19, 
uh, for Samuel's 80th birthday, not long before he died. She'd arrived tough-minded talking the way Lisa talked now, which is to say, like an American college student, trying to engage people in hard conversations in English about Palestine. It was only when she returned home that she realized the people at the party were a who's who of the Israeli left, many of whom had taken enormous risks for just the causes that she thought she was shocking them with. Rather than claim the moral standing they'd more than earned, they'd humored her, perhaps seeing some of Samuel's fire in his grandson. When she understood what they'd done, she burned with shame. Now, in fact, she kept up a correspondence for a while with one of them, Lior, who hadn't batted an eye when she'd come out to him as queer after extracting a promise that he'd never tell her grandfather. Lior seemed not only accepting, but excited about it, and assured her that he and Shmuel, as he called Samuel, had known many homosexual activists in Tel Aviv as early as the 70s. In fact, Lior seemed to be in touch with them now, and often encouraged her to come to Tel Aviv for a summer. He said he could find an apartment and introduce her to old friends eager to connect to the new generation of gay activists. Martha was flattered and somewhat frightened by the notion that Lior saw her as any kind of activist at all. I mean, what activity? Lior said, well, we're all born a baby. Every revolutionary was once just a person with opinions. And a person with opinions was once a person whose eyes were merely open and didn't shut off. They're talking fast, okay. Um, this reassured Martha, but there was still the problem of her transition. Lior had only known her as Marcus, the possibly gay, possibly anarchist, smarter than she really was, grandson of Shmuel, who Lior also seemed to idealize. She didn't think she could face him as who she was. And in fact, intentionally or unintentionally, as she began to transition in her mid 20s, she cut ties with everyone who had known her as Marcus, including Lior. She spent three years angry and in love and looking like a man and being spit on and finding new unexpected solidarities. And then suddenly, in a moment like this one, her head was above water. She found her way back to her family, a few old friends, and she drank with them a lot. In three years of loneliness, it was hard to tell who had changed more. When she finally got the nerve to email Lior, the message bounced. He was dead. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, I think that was a few minutes. Uh, so uh, where, was, where did I think that could go from here? Yeah, OK. Um, let's see if we can jump in here. So the night before, when they were all drunk, Lisa had held forth for approximately a solid hour on the concept of femme. I gotta have the quotes. No one was really all that curious about this topic and no one could remember why she was talking about it. Well, the basic shape was that people who were the wrong kind of trans were somehow betraying an ideal. And the victims of this betrayal were a group that sometimes looked like trans people, sometimes like trans feminine people, sometimes like trans women, and sometimes like trans women of color. The relevant categories seemed to always shrink just to the point of leaving everyone else in the room, either outside or on the insecure fuzzy border of the concept. Martha thought, it'd be funny if someone really dark skinned came into our lives, but maybe then she'd have to shut up. This game wouldn't work anymore, but this seemed very unlikely to occur. This story is said in Oregon. Um, still, Martha thought, let there be another stranger. But then she remembered the last one, sipped. Um, Lisa's rant is too annoying, I'm gonna skip it. Um, so she rants a bit. Everyone was puzzled by this one. Who was she even talking to? I mean, it was normal for this kind of blog-like auto-sociological rambling to go unchallenged while they drank their gin and lemonade. But this time it broke something in Martha. She cut in. Can you just shut the fuck up for once? I mean, we're all trans here. We know what you're saying to the extent that there's anything to this idea that we should think of all trans women as lipstick lesbians, which there isn't. The problem is you can't seem to get it into your head that anyone besides you knows anything. Like, do you think I haven't read Rocco Bulldagger or whatever forum lore you're hopped up on right now? Every night you're holding forth on trans solidarity or whatever, but there's nothing solidaristic about you. What a great activist you are. What an engaged intellectual you are lecturing us in our own home. You know, what I think is going on is that your personality just has no resources for any situation where you're not kind of the Highlander. You gotta be the only one with anything to say about it, either because you're actually the only trans woman in the room or because somewhere back there, somehow she drew out the last word. Somehow you must have been the smart kid. That's a, were you an older brother or something? Did you know Georgia studies feminist philosophy? Did you know I studied actual philosophy? I mean, sorry, Georgia. I mean, I don't even agree with her about anything, but I respect her. We're both people with ideas in our own histories. Are you? Did it even occur to you to ask what anybody else thinks or what we, whether we've thought about this before? And did you even experience any of the history you're talking about during this time that we've been supposedly all in it together in what you call transness? 
Weren't you mostly just staring at your phone, tasting slogans, acting like you knew people from LiveJournal, probably trying to get up the nerve to transition at all while the rest of us were in the shit? And you're so possessive about fucking language. What makes these words your words? Is it just because you're half black? And by the way, if you're so black, how come you're telling us about it? Where are your black friends? Could it be that you don't have any because you're a fucking Oreo, that they don't exist? See, the problem here is that real black women wouldn't put up with your shit. And for some reason, you think that I will. Now, the room had fallen silent. You don't call me a racist. Go blog about it. I don't want to call you a racist. Lisa seemed truly hurt. Martha spit out the words, well, maybe you should. As the rant poured out of Martha, she had seen herself from the outside. It was kind of the same feeling she'd had remembering the moment of a bike crash, the moment where you can see it coming, but can't quite get out of the way or do anything. It's better to forget moments like that. And it seemed to Martha that that was what trauma was, reality arriving unprocessed and rough and sort of robotic. It was too harsh. Martha could even feel that as she said it, and not because it was so cutting or knowing, but because it felt undeniable that in spite of any apparent argument or fine observation, it was both completely out of control and aimed not at any kind of understanding, but at Lisa's total destruction. Martha remembered a conversation with Lily, always out of it, but occasionally wise, who had said, if you want to burn a bridge, make sure you're not standing on it. And she'd done that. She'd blown up again. The one thing she didn't want to do until she had a plan to get out. She'd succeeded in turning the apartment into a war zone. Was Lisa even so bad? I mean, she certainly seemed to talk over people, but it's not a death sentence for being a bad conversationalist. And besides, Martha thought Lisa was some kind of a writer or trying to be. Maybe being a writer depends on being the kind of person who can forget who you're talking to. And anyone who is too conscious of that would just clam up in front of a blank page. And maybe it depends on being willing to have the same conversation a hundred times. Otherwise you'd lose your heart on when it came time to edit. Maybe they've all gotta be like that or they'll lose their nerve. See, there really was something offensive about Lisa's way of being, but it wasn't in her compulsive internet gender discourse spout. That's everybody these days. The sad thing was that she thought she could really get it right and that would be it. She seemed to really believe that if she could just work out the right gender incantations and get her strangely childish friend to fall in love with her, it would all be okay. And since both tasks were obviously impossible, Lisa could put off really confronting, well, here Martha's thought trailed off. Some kind of disappointment was at the heart of it. Some kind of end of the night realization. The point was that Lisa was a child too. She hadn't faced her fears. Martha thought, when you get done with your stupid problems, you have to face down the real thing. You might find out you're human like the rest of us. Even as these thoughts, which had come quickly, seemed to reconcile her slightly to Lisa, Martha had thought better of saying more, better to save the blessed condescension. Lisa was already crying, so not a lot of good in invoking the abyss of freedom or the urgency of Jewish anarchism. And soon Penny was confronting Lisa, Georgia was looking sad as ever, and Martha was pouring another drink. For gentlemen, there's always another, so much then for the end of the night, thus the hangover, thus this morning's coffee trip, and her recording went on. Um, I think that was probably around my 10 minutes. And so uh, I'll, I'll just stop there. Um, yeah, sorry that I couldn't actually offer any context um, for these characters who are very angry at each other. I'll, I'll, I'll offer the context that I, I recently started talking to someone, you could imagine how, who likes to hear about dreams. And she told me that there's no anger in your dreams. And it was like hearing a bell that, that, you know, that wakes you up and it, it keeps resonating. Um, and so I, I've been trying to write anger. It's, I, that's, that's why this is happening now. Anyway, um, all right, thanks all. Thanks, Jackie. Um, our last reader today is Momtaza Mary. Momtaza is also an essayist and independent research, researcher suffering from a fixation with translation, transitory states, and transnationalisms. Her latest pamphlet, Doing the Most with the Least, was published by Goldsmiths Press. Please welcome Momtaza. Greetings all. Uh, thank you, Brooklyn Rail, for facilitating this, and um, thanks, Shiv, for inviting me. Um, I was trying to retain my composure through Jackie's reading, um, but yeah, thank you, Jackie. That was amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read some some newish poems from a project I've been working on for a while now, um, which is riddled with all kinds of places, people, placeholders, um, formations, failures in form and other kinds of failures. But um, so I'm just gonna be reading some of these uh, poems in succession and hopefully I won't go over time. I know I have the, the honor of being the last, um, but hopefully not the least. So this will be the first poem. Thursday, Lemonuba. She hears revolt in the language of birds, 
The caffeinated are often more generous with their interpretations. From here, the sunset belongs to the masses. The city waters itself with the fantasies of its victims. From here, she can see it all. All of it and more than can be contained. Neighborhood cats walk with more authority than newly landed refugees. She is disentangling herself from a history she doesn't belong to, from the decanted clarity of a future she doesn't own. What to celebrate tonight? There must be something. The market woman's breath tickling the earlobes during a hug, cool balcony air, lightly spiced aubergines, a phone on silent mode. The prickly man who lives upstairs inviting her to a rooftop to discuss the murderous nature of NGOs and Netflix. A request with no ulterior motives. Further gratitude for the end of mosquito season, for those glorious moments when men resist predictability. She'll watch mint leaves float to the surface. People are so beautiful when they are unsure, when they sit with what may they may never know, when they eat off the same plate every evening and call it loyalty. Postcard from Castel Porziano, rare scene of a poet caught in a state of glorified impotence. So this is just a poem about many things, but the anchor is the International Poetry Festival that was held at Castel Porziano, which is like a resort near Rome in 1979, um, on the same beach where Pasolini was shot a few years earlier. And um, I think I, I would recommend the film by um, Andrea, Andrea has got a film, that captures the descent of that reading into a kind of creative sort of chaos or this kind of disorder because all these kind of anarchists in the stage take over and sort of like challenge um, uh, the Americans right to just like be reciting poetry at them. So they kind of invade the stage and it's a really, I think it's a really interesting kind of intervention. Um, but yeah, check out that film. That's a pretty cool film. Um, so yeah. 22 poets, three days. Riots have needed less ingredients. Alchemical gathering on the beach where Pasolini was shot. Ossia's crushed nose. Africa, my only alternative, he wrote. They remember him for who he was. He loved the way a foreigner does from a burning distance. The way a son loves a father returning from a war waged in a land his son mystifies like the eyes of Sico Toure, black just as Rimbaud was blonde, wild spirits in polka dot bikinis coming up for air. Money is your God, the poet chants, few things the crowd claps for, they roar disgust, wash pit jeers, throne chairs, bare chested men booing. It's 1979, so the revolution is somewhere between a redacted word and a TV advert. It's sand blowing through hair, a toothpick between Baraka's lips. Is Yevtushenko talking his big game? Ginsburg tries to pacify with lusty oms. For once, no one listens to the North Americans, alhamdulillah. Fire breathers snatch attention, young anarchists invade podiums, promising soup for everyone. One drop makes the whole world kin. Anne Waldman wants to know what happened to Augustine and his mother in Ostia. A man flashes the crowd, Bacchus in a bathrobe. Fanculo, fanculo, fanculo. Vim voiced Aldo Piromelli repeats, sounding like my aunt's long distance complaints, heartsick over her hometown, her boys in their hometowns. Children pull cords, swallow mics. I think of how we need more toddler hectic at poetry readings, more children pointing at naked emperors. Gregory Corso, where are you? I can't spot Ted Jones, but I know he died broke, like most black poets. After they killed Armadou, he swore he'd never live in America again. Take the hint and extrapolate or expatriate. Both involve a stretching of the body beyond its delimitations. Carefree sunbathers lounge by the harbour. No one cares what the poets say or who their poems are dedicated to. Sometimes people just want to stretch about in the sun. They don't want to hear about things they can't change. 
Sometimes they only want to use their hands to swim or to destroy. Secondhand deliberations outside the block of flats Mahmoud Darwish once lived in, in the 80s, apparently. I'm a stone's throw away from my father's lost decade. Beirut makes my calves hurt in a delirious way, like the rent I can't afford the history I wade through. I tug at my own dignity like an old man unfamiliar with the shape of his own insignificance. I want to buy a book that will teach me something I don't want to know, something that will wreck me into pieces. I want to be unraveled in the afternoon light, to be skinned by love and left on the bench for someone else to marvel at and envy. I want my tongue's damp evidence on folded paper. I want to disown what disowns me. Longevity terrifies me. I trust my own instincts more than I trust the weather app, but less than the weather. Jasmine falls onto my sketchbook. How predictable, how voluptuous, excess, a good cliche is unbeatable. No one can save me from what I seek. Victimhood is gray monotony. A spectacular ending is still an ending. I have tried the consensus of defeat. I have become it. Look around you. The stairs are uneven. They are ceremonially blue. The spirit is palatial. The priest. I want more than what they can give. I want to be eternally indebted to something other than my regrets. So I'll end with this poem. It's not you, it's the housing crisis. My inability thickened like cream, a clump of nothing. I inherited my nausea, my granulated bobs of useless want. My body became a shoebox, a hiding spot within a hiding spot. My body became a poem. My body edited the poem. My body sent the poem to a journal. My body was rejected. My body was not avant-garde enough. My body politicized the poem. My body stretched around the poem. My body paid the bills the poem didn't. My body suggested grad school and the poem was disgusted. I grew tired of it all, my body and the poem. My poem body grew older by the minute. My nervous limbed assembly line of artistic ingents. My chrysalis of indulgent choices. It wasn't advisable or sane to live as a poem. My body refused to be realistic. It wasn't sensible to eat like a poem, handfuls of glass and sugar. Unrecommended to drink like a poem, to sleep like a poem, one hand splayed, hair in mouth. One day there would have to be a choice, my body or the poem. When I wrote of love, I trusted it would cave in on me like the damp roof. My poem starved, my body was the garret. I willed both into submission. I slept like a baby. Thank you everyone for listening and being here with us. Thank you, Montaza. Th thank you all, this was a really uh, fabulous reading. Um, Jackie, Violet, Shiv, Joseph, Montaza, thank you so much. And Shiv, thanks for putting this together. Um, thank you for having me. And thanks to Brooklyn Rail. Um, this is really kind of an incredible thing. Um, and thanks to everyone uh, for reading and for coming. We, um, we're gonna have another reading next week. And there's a book uh, coincidentally coming out of Gregory Corso's late poems, actually the last poems that he, he wrote the last few years of his life. It's gonna be published sometime in the next month or so. And we're gonna have a reading from that book with Brenda Coltis, Simon Pettit, Kyle DeCuyan, Tanasa Nair, Frederick and Rochelle Rame, and Raymond Foy, the editor will also be around. So if, uh, if you wanna hear some new Corso, unpublished Corso, come around next week. And otherwise, I think now's the time that we turn off everybody's, or turn on everybody's mics or something, and everybody can now scream into the, uh, into the void and say hello or, and goodbye. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, that was wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Violet. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Ansom. Thanks, Ansom. Thank you, Ansom. Thank you, Paul. Um... I feel thanks like everyone for joining. Right on. Thanks, guys. See you next time. That was so fun. Thank you, Shiv. That was. That was, awesome. that was great. And Joseph, like I just read your book and I had no idea what your voice sounded like. It was it was fantastic. To, to oh, I'm so so glad. I hope that it lived up. <laughs> 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 when I saw you when I saw you read it last year I felt like there was more growling which was nice <laughs> I feel like I had to read longer like I like lost my voice like halfway through the oh movie. so it was just uh, like, just strain <laughs> it was purely durational strain <laughs> shredding it like a rock star that's all Violet was that uh an excerpt of a longer piece or a whole piece that you read or I was just sort of curious about the shape of it um basically for the last few months I've just been doing a thing where I write continuously while drinking coffee in the morning and each like there were pauses that you maybe noticed and each one represents the unit of like a cup of coffee <laughs> oh. so I think there's separate poems Okay, thanks. I kind of stopped titling things or articulating, like, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but thanks for asking. I really felt like I was like, okay, I have exactly 10 minutes, so I can't say anything about what the poems are. <laughs> but no, I, I like that. I, uh... I think that's a good choice, yeah. <laughs> Montasa, what was the name of that film that you were recommending? Um, the film itself uh, it has it has different titles, but the the Italian title is um, Castel Porziano um, Ostia di Poeti. But the uh, there's a European title that's like Lunatics Lovers Poets. Oh my gosh! Yeah, oh I, I prefer that one. Um, but it's an interesting reading. I think uh, we were discussing at the beginning, sort of like miss the the mosh pit atmosphere <laughs> of readings and it very much exemplifies that <laughs> that sounds great i'm definitely going to try and hecklers that. yeah hecklers. <laughs> not not zoom hecklers but other forms i feel like i'd like to see like a kind of a, a genre of like poet destroys hecklers you know that there's a, there's a whole <laughs> kind of culture of comedians just being incredibly scandalized by the concept of being talked back to. Um, it's like one of the, the rare, you know, sort of truly enforced bits of, of kind of cultural reverences that we have. Um, but I don't think poets do it. I, I think, I guess I remember there, a story about Eileen Miles telling somebody off for a bad question. That's like 15 years. We need, we need new blood. <laughs> There's a, uh, a story that you may or may not know of Jack Kerouac heckling Frank O'Hara at a reading in the late 1950s. And, um, and finally, Kerouac yelled something at him like, O'Hara, you're ruining American poetry. And O'Hara said, well, that's more than you've ever done for it, Jack. Actually, my mother got heckled at a reading in San Francisco and she just told the person to fuck off. <laughs> we were just talking about that last month, actually. <laughs> that story came up. It was sort of uh, being described as an incredibly soft and polite use of the word fuck. <laughs> heckling stories. <laughs> I was at this talk last night by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and they opened with like basically pleading for people to interrupt them talking about in the Berkeley Poetry Conference which there are audio recordings of the younger students are constantly just 
screaming to interrupt whatever the assigned speakers are saying but nobody nobody had the courage and I felt like I was gonna have to do it but didn't do anything <laughs> Are you on Zoom? Uh, that was that was in real life. That was in real life. Um, okay. Yeah. I feel like it's hard to heckle on Zoom authentically. If such, <laughs> like, what am I doing? Well, hopefully we can graduate. <laughs> uh, Montaz, I think I we I don't know if it's just me, but I lost you. That, I feel like that kind of technical thing makes the heckling so difficult. It's like hard enough to have just even like a normally paced like conversation that like interjecting at all is just like it's hard. It's hard to even to, you know, determine it as something in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. Everything's interruption. Everything's Zoom is total heck, heckle totality is all it, that's that's like the entire medium of Zoom. I mean, I think that everyone on Zoom gets like automatically heckled if they're giving a reading because the only response that you actually get is silence after you're done, <laughs> just like pure, uh, like just a, a blur of silence. It feels horrible. Um, makes yeah, the mosh pit really should be next. I love the mosh pit is you gotta bring it back. Gotta open up the pit. The mute button can't be my only freedom. It's not enough. <laughs> you guys Maybe were all self heckling is the way to go. It was a phenomenal reading. No one heckling great. would have been as funny or as cutting as the actual readers. <laughs> That's true. There was some brutality. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you skipped that rant, Jackie. That's uh, <laughs> really uh, pulling punches. <laughs> it's a, what a brilliant marketing strategy, though. Because now I'm like, I gotta, read the, I gotta buy the book to get yeah. the rant. I gotta, you gotta read the rant. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll probably come out in like five years. Or <laughs> yeah. It's the trouble with the pace of novels. It, it really sucks. You know, like I wrote Daryl in 2016, or I guess 17 mostly. And uh, this thing now, I think when it's, uh, I don't know. I, I got to learn how to publish short fiction. I don't get it. I'm, I'm publishing like one short story soon, but supposedly people just chop up little bits of their book and publish it all over the place. Mm. I, I just keep writing the same thing over and over and over again. So not interested in publishing apparently. <laughs> That's good because once you publish once, it's taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, nice labor saving device. <laughs> I've actually, I have to jump off, but I do want to say thank you to everybody again. And this was, it was, uh, what an honor to be with you all. It's really amazing. It's totally special. Thank you, thank Joseph. You. Bye, Joseph. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Take yeah. care. This was a, a shimmering 80th celebration. So I really appreciate and thank all of you. Thank you. I think I'll hop off as well. Um, hope to see you all in person sometime. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I have to call it a day. All right. Take care, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. 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 Thank you.